On September 24th, Taiwan's Air Defense Identification Zone monitoring platform unveiled a bone-chilling revelation. At the break of dawn, a mainland Chinese Y-9 military communication aircraft lurked beneath Cathay Pacific Flight CX-366, a Boeing 777 loaded with up to 368 passengers, journeying from Hong Kong to Shanghai through the Taiwan Strait. The audacious maneuver suggests that China might be using commercial jets as radar shields for their military crafts, blinding enemy radars by merging their signature with that of a civilian jet. The gamble here is that of an astonishing magnitude. Hypothetically, if the CCP successfully deploys this tactic with a swarm of military jets shadowing under a commercial airliner and launches a long-range missile strike against Taiwan, the counterattack could sacrifice passengers on the civilian plane. In the most sinister scenario, the CCP might even orchestrate the downfall of the civilian jet, conveniently pinning the tragedy on Taiwan, turning the 368 innocent souls on board into pawns. Why single out a Hong Kong flight for this sinister strategy? Using a domestic flight would be too blatant, easily decoded as a formal strategy, drawing widespread condemnation. Targeting a Japanese or Korean flight might spark an international uproar. Thus, a Hong Kong flight became their optimal pawn, putting other nations in a diplomatically awkward position when responding. This calls to mind Operation Babylon in 1981, where Israel, by mimicking commercial jet radar signatures through tactical flight formations, obliterated a nuclear reactor near Baghdad. In the 1976 Operation Entebbe, Israel again exploited radar deception to rescue Jewish hostages from a hijacked French airliner. But compared to Israel's simulation tactics, the CCP's audacity to use an actual commercial jet as a shield demonstrates their commitment to strategic gains even at the expense of innocent lives. Recent reports and social media are buzzing with tales of another CCP strategy, stationing military strongholds in the middle of urban centers and residential areas. This essentially deploys civilians as living human shields against adversarial strikes. Last August, during the missile exercises encircling Taiwan, the CCP's ambition was checked after launching 11 of 70 readied missiles. Each missile launch revealed its origin, leaving its details wide open for American intelligence. Most disconcerting is the revelation that these DF-17 missile platforms came from civilian zones most notably in Ningde, Fujian province. The facade of Beijing's 23 Xinjiekou outer street masks a fortress for numerous covert military establishments. Elsewhere, Beijing's quiet residential sector of Huaishuling unfolds a jarring tableau of tanks, artillery, and armored carriers tied to the ominous North Vehicle Research Institute of China's ordnance industry, parked next to playgrounds and homes. Liancheng Airport in Fujian, which looks like an ordinary airfield, is strategically tailored to dodge Taiwanese interventions. Yet, its proximity to schools makes them inadvertent targets, should the airfield be targeted. Sixty such vulnerable airstrips pepper China's landscape. In Hong Kong, iconic skyscrapers, including the Liaison Office and the Bank of China Tower, are Trojan horses, housing military-grade communication arsenals. Chinese are also unwittingly subject to electromagnetic radiation, with unsuspecting communities in Fujian suffering high cancer rates. That the CCP blurs civilian military lines shows their determination to eke out every military advantage, no matter the cost. Last May, Reuters exposed an audio recording of a conference held by Guangdong's Joint Military Civilian Command Center. Guangdong, under directives from the eastern and southern war zones, was to rally 140,000 non-active duty personnel, conscript or otherwise produce 953 civilian ships, and amass 1,653 drones and unmanned naval vessels. Beyond these numbers, the blueprint involved commandeering 20 strategic airports and ports, six pivotal shipyards, and a plethora of civilian resources from grain stores and hospitals to blood tanks and fuel reserves. While these measures were labeled for civilian use, they are likely acts of militarization. Guangdong Military Region's political commissar Huang Shanchun 
underscored the intent to use the populace as a shield for military operations. Civilian vessels that had been weaponized will be replaced by veterans of the People's Liberation Army. What's more, the costs for the changeover would be borne by civilian ship owners. This tactic isn't new. As early as 2015, China's premier ferry manufacturer stated that their ferries were designed for both civilian and military use. Recent amphibious assault drills by the CCP showcased the 13,000-ton Bohai Maju ferry, which is more than two and a half times the size of the American Jumbo Mark II ferry. The CCP's navy has an amphibious transport capability of 370,000 tons. However, China and Hong Kong's combined roll-on, roll-off cargo ship's capacity has skyrocketed to an astonishing 2.3 million tons. In a mere span of eight days, this formidable armada could ferry the entirety of 31 U.S. Brigade combat teams. The audacity and scale of such preparation is a chilling testimony to the lengths the CCP is prepared to go. The Chinese operators include ferries under Bohai Ferry Group, an arm of the 8th Transport Battalion dedicated to strategic support vessels, Hainan Strait Shipping Company, whose ferries operate under the 9th Transport Group, and Changjiang Roll-On Roll-Off Logistics Co. Ltd., whose ferries are affiliated with the 5th Transport Group. Military analyst Tom Shugart sent shockwaves through the social media platform X, revealing that by the end of last July, three of China's largest and newest roll-on, roll-off civilian ferries were mobilizing, shadowing the Taiwan Strait possibly linked to the PLA's military exercises in response to former U.S. Speaker Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan. The Zhonghua Fuxing Ferry, launched in 2019, was spotted transporting tanks during an exercise in 2021. As per automatic identification system data from X-account Marine Traffic, this behemoth set sail southwards to the northern entrance of the Taiwan Strait on July 30th, after leaving the Tianjin port on the 29th, where it was loaded with tanks in 2021. Bohai Ma another massive vessel from the Bohai Ferry Fleet, was built in 2015. By the end of July, it mysteriously diverged from its regular route between Dalian and Yantai, finally anchoring in Qingdao. The third ferry is Bohai Zhuanzhu, also crafted in 2015. This ship was seemingly laden with cargo in Tianjin and was later spotted navigating the Taiwan Strait, heading towards the southern end near Shantou by the end of July. As Speaker Pelosi landed in Taiwan, a Google satellite image from August 4th showed the CCP discreetly offloading war machinery in Qingdao, tanks, armored vehicles, and military transport vehicles from their roll-on, roll-off ships. Bizarrely, these war assets remained conspicuously absent in their subsequent military exercises around Taiwan, suggesting they are being reserved for a covert operation, though for some unexplained reason, the plot was not put into motion. A procession of trucks roared away from the ferry crossing. Tanks stand sentinel nearby. The caravan of vehicles and trucks seemed endless, stretching, stretching, vanishing into the very heart of the city swallowed by the vast expanse of the highway. Returning to the dockyard, a formidable assembly awaits. Around 70 tanks, mammoth trucks, other armored vehicles, and self-propelled artillery. Beyond the docks, the silhouettes of even more armored vehicles can be seen. A closer count reveals nearly 500 military vehicles between the parking areas and the truck procession. Given the ferry's capacity, one vessel could hardly bear such weight. How many roll-on, roll-off ships were needed to offload this arsenal? Back in 2002, a document emerged from the PLA Navy's Dalian Naval Academy, titled, Equipping Civilian Ships with Missile Weapon Systems. This paper hinted at a future where civilian vessels could be turned into launch platforms, overcoming superior forces using inferior equipment. The document notes the tactical edge retrofitting missile launchers on several-ton civilian ships. These smaller vessels, with their minimal radar cross-section, are nearly invisible to adversaries. Their ability to strike from the shadows and deliver a sudden, crippling blow offers significant battlefield advantages at a fraction of the cost. 
Throughout history, the CCP has used civilians as human shields on the front lines, while strategically seizing territories from behind. Let's look at a few examples from the civil war between nationalists and communist forces in the 1920s to the 1940s. In 1948, the northeastern city of Changchun was besieged by CCP forces for five months. Confined within city walls, Changchun residents became pawns in the military game as essential supplies became scarce. Over 160,000 civilians starved to death, representing a third of the city's inhabitants. In their desperate bid for survival, some were driven to the unfathomable acts of cannibalism. Even consuming family members, despite risking their lives, pleading under a hail of bullets for mercy and passage, all they received was the CCP's cold-hearted refusal and brutal suppression. This hell on earth incited global outrage. The independent media Ta Kung Pao denounced it as the shameful battle of Changchun. The New York Times critically remarked, in the civil war between the nationalists and the communists. Hunger and communism have become China's twin nightmares. Xin Hao Nan, a Chinese scholar now residing in the United States, disclosed startling information stemming from an insider story shared by a retired officer of the CCP from the Jinan military zone. It sheds light on how the CCP defeated the Kuomintang's elite 74th Division in the Mengliangu campaign in 1947 on the slopes of Mengliangu. As the communist forces charged, Kuomintang soldiers were met with an unimaginable sight—a throng of unarmed seniors. Bullets rained down, only to abruptly halt, for the Kuomintang soldiers couldn't bring themselves to pull the trigger on these unarmed elderly. These elders were labeled by the Communist Party as counter-revolutionary landlords and rich peasants, and were forced into the suicidal frontline role. The subsequent charge by the communist forces was even more diabolical. They used a wave of children as cannon fodder, sending them to the very front. The sight paralyzed the Kuomintang soldiers. These children were identified as the offspring of landlords and rich farmers. Seeing that the Kuomintang couldn't pull the trigger, CCP forces relentlessly advanced. But the most shocking and grotesque assault was the third charge. What Kuomintang soldiers saw was a wall of white sheets. As these sheets were dropped, they unveiled groups of naked young women. Labeled by the communists as the daughters and daughters-in-law of landlords and rich peasants, the Kuomintang soldiers, mortified, cast aside their machine guns. These tactics were later recommended by CCP General Peng Dehuai to North Korea's Kim Il Sung as a strategy to counteract the American forces. With profound gravity, Xin Hao Nian lamented, "In this battle, the heroic Kuomintang general Zhang Lingpu chose martyrdom, facing such acts." How could the CCP generals not be consumed with shame? In the sweeping annals of history, Chiang Kai-shek, the formidable leader of the Kuomintang, shines as a beacon of defiant virtue against the shadowy backdrop of the Chinese Communist Party's machinations. In 1949, with the CCP inebriated in their self-aggrandizing victory revelries, Chiang, in a moment of unparalleled gravitas, chose honor over opportunity. Halting a catastrophic bombing assault to protect Beijing's irreplaceable cultural heart and its unsuspecting souls, with fervent conviction, he declared, "I shan't tread the tragic steps of Xiang Yu or the destructive march of the Anglo-French. To deface the timeless city would render him an eternal betrayer of a civilization's spirit." Yet, in a twist of dark irony, the CCP, which holds sway over a scanty six percent of China's teeming billions, cunningly orchestrates the entire 1.4 billion to be its unwitting pawns, shield bearers, and debt settlers. But the tides are turning. China's soul awakens with a clarion call from its citizens: "You want privileges? Lead us into battle first." The CCP is not China's voice; it's the very dagger plunged deep into its heart.